of this vector to zero. If the vector is zero mils in length, it doesn't matter what angle it is. So the final angle of any residual unbalance does not matter. The amount or length of the final vector is the key. To do this, we need to add weight to create a vector the same length as the reference vector, but in the opposite direction. Then they will cancel themselves out and it will be balanced. In reality, there are two problems. First, we don't know how much weight equals six mils of vibration. And secondly, we don't know where to put it to be opposite the reference vector. So we put on a trial weight of a known size at a known location and measure the response to it. The measurement result from the addition of the trial weight is 4.5 mils at 210 degrees. When this point is plotted and an arrow is drawn from the zero location, it can be labeled as R plus T or the result of the trial weight added to the reference data. The difference from the reference or R vector to the R plus T vector is the effect of the trial weight and is labeled T. When it is measured, it is a length equal to 9.1 mils. This means that if this seen trial weight is moved to any other location on the rotor, it will have 9.1 mils of effect. If it is placed in the wrong location, it would increase the vibration instead of reducing it. Our goal was to create a T vector exactly the opposite direction from the R or reference vector. This angle here is how much we need to move the trial weight to swing the T vector exactly opposite. In this case, the angle is 25 degrees. If we move the trial weight the 25 degrees, the result would be a vector of 270 degrees and 3.1 mils long, indicating the weight is too heavy. The correct amount of weight is found by multiplying the trial weight by vector R divided by vector T. In this case, we only need 66%, or two-thirds of the trial weight amount. Remember that the trial weight is a temporary weight, and its only purpose is to determine the system's response to additional weight so the correct amount and location of the weight can be determined. This response is called the influence coefficient. The influence coefficient is how many mils change is produced by one unit of weight, such as a gram or ounce. In our example, if the trial weight was six grams and it produced a change or T vector of 9.1 mils, the influence coefficient is just over 1.5 mils per gram. We can calculate the amount of weight needed as a correction by dividing the reference value of 6 mils by 1.5 mils per gram to equal 4 grams as the correction weight. This is the same number derived earlier from the calculations where we determined that we needed two-thirds of the trial weight amount, which is 4 grams. Since the correction weight is based on the response of the trial weight, the trial weight must produce a substantial change from the reference vector for most accurate results. A rule of thumb is, the trial weight must produce a 30% change in the amplitude, or a 30 degree change in the angle. If the trial weight does not meet this 30-30 rule, repeat the trial run using a new trial weight. If we add this 4 gram correction weight at an angle 25 degrees from the trial weight location, it should correct all the unbalance or drive it to zero. However, it may not do that. In this case, the unbalance is 1.5 mils at 240 degrees. Since our balancing spec calls for one mil, we are not through yet. The obvious question is, why didn't the unbalance go to zero as calculated? The reason is that the calculation is based on the assumption that the system is linear. That is, no matter how much or how little vibration is due to unbalance, it will always respond the same. But in reality, most systems are not linear, but respond differently due to other influences, especially as the unbalanced condition is less dominant. However, in general, once the correction weight is applied, the unbalance can be reduced further by trim balancing. A trim balance is a calculation for further weights based on leaving the weights on. Our previous calculations were based on removing the trial weight and its effect and replacing it with a new weight called the correction weight. Since the correction weight reduced vibration to 1.5 mils, it will be left in place. This 1.5 mils at 240 degrees is now the vector which we must drive to zero. Here we make an assumption that the system response is the same for the trial weight, 
That is, that one gram of weight will still produce 1.5 mils of change. So for this trim balance, we will use one gram of weight and move at the appropriate angle to create a vector in the opposite direction to push the vibration to zero. This trim weight put the vibration due to unbalance within specs, but we could continue trim balancing to further reduce the vibration. This new vector, 0.9 mils at 220 degrees, is now the vector that must be driven to zero. Each succeeding trim balance should further reduce the vibration. If it quits responding or gets worse, it's most likely due to other machinery conditions that are now dominant. For example, if a machine has some mechanical looseness in the rotating mass, it may not be apparent while the forces due to unbalance are pulling on the rotor. But as the force due to unbalance is reduced, the rotor has more freedom to move and bounce against the housing, causing the phase to be unsteady and making further attempts to balance ineffective. We have been using vectors in the simplest of balance jobs, a single plane, single measurement point balance procedure. To illustrate the four steps of balancing, remember that the trial weight is used to measure the response of the system and is usually removed. However, if it substantially reduces the vibration, for example, from six mils to two mils, you may want to leave it on. But remember to allow for that in the calculations. Because the trial weight is used to determine the influence coefficient, a one-shot balance can be achieved later on this machine if the sensor location, the tack location, and this influence coefficient are known. For example, if the machine develops an unbalance of 4.5 mils, you can avoid the trial run because you know that one gram produces 1.5 mils of change on this machine. Use the trim balance calculations for the location of the weight. Remember that trim balancing is based on leaving the previous weight on. The next section walks through the steps of a single plane balance using a balancing analyzer. We have been examining the characteristics of unbalance and the principles of the balancing process. Here, we will perform a single plane balance procedure on a rotor kit using a balance analyzer that performs the calculations for us. We will not go through all the analyzer screens because the programs differ somewhat. But whether you use an analyzer with a balance program, a balancing analyzer, a computer-based balancing program, or just a balancing calculator, you will be able to apply the information presented here to perform successful balancing. First, gather all the tools and equipment needed, including trial weights, correction weights, and the tools for attaching them. You'll need tools to open the access to the rotor and tools for cleaning the rotor. You'll need the equipment for measuring the vibration and phase data, including the analyzer, sensors, a photo tack with reflective tape, and the necessary cables. Be sure to include a machinery lockout and follow all standard operating procedures regarding safety during the entire balance job. After performing the seven pre-balancing steps, select the measurement point locations and the tack location. These should not be moved during the entire balance job. Don't use a handheld sensor because both the phase and vibration amplitude will not be repeatable. And don't move a sensor from one measurement point to the other. Use a separate sensor for each measurement point and don't move them until the job is done. You will achieve better results with less room for error. You may use as many sensors as your program can utilize. The balance program uses the least square spit method, comparing the effects at each location and minimizing the vibration for all points. Usually one sensor at each bearing location produces good results. Select the direction with the highest vibration. We will use two sensors, one at each bearing location. Some balancing programs ask for pertinent data, including the job number, the person doing the work, the machine name and ID number, and the location it is in the plant. These are not required for successful balancing, but document the job so the finished balance job can be transferred to a computer used for the predictive maintenance program and stored along with other PDM data. Then, if the machine needs balanced again, the balance job can be loaded back into the analyzer for a one-shot balance job. This will allow your company to implement a balancing strategy and not just perform balances. Define the balance job indicating the number of weight planes, measurement planes, and measurement points. 
Some programs have a graphical capability that displays the phase measurements and solution on a diagram of the rotor. Options such as the tack options are used for this and to help in setup for repeat balancing. Mark the rotor with reflective tape. The system triggers on the leading edge of the tape, so it will be the zero mark on the rotor. Be sure to define the sensor and specify whether the analyzer provides power to the sensors. Define the sensor output units. Velocity and displacement are both acceptable. Here we will use displacement in units of mils. If your program has the option for defining the location of the sensors, define their locations. This information is for repeatability. Now we are ready to make the measurements. Select the reference run and make a measurement for one point. Wait until the phase and amplitude are stable before accepting them. The program may have a gauge indicating the stability of the tack and vibration. Repeat the step for each measurement point. If you see a problem such as a loose cable, correct the problem and retake the data. This data is stored when it is accepted. The reference or as is run measurements are completed. Stop the machine and lock it out. Select a trial weight and a position for placement. Remember that the true phase method counts the angle opposite rotation, which is the same as beginning to count as the rotor passes the zero mark, 10, 20, 30 degrees, and so on. A balancing compass that magnetically attaches to the rotor can help make accurate angle measurements. The more precise you make angle and weight measurements, the less likely you are to have poor balancing results. Use accurate scales to make accurate weight measurements. Record the trial weight amount and location in the analyzer and attach this trial weight to the rotor. Some machines can use screws or bolts for trial weights while others must use a clamp-on design. If the trial weight must be welded on, tack it on lightly, remembering that it may have to come off. Be sure to include the weight of the welding rod used. After attaching the trial weight, Unlock the machine, start it, and collect trial run data for each measurement point. Be sure to wait for the signal to become very stable before accepting the data. Once the trial run data is collected for both measurement points, the analyzer can calculate the correction weights needed. If the trial weight reduced the vibration by at least 60% from the initial data, then leave the trial weight on and include it in the correction weight calculation. Most balancing programs have the capability of including or excluding the trial weight in the correction calculations. Notice the correction weight placement is not 180 degrees out from the reference run phase angle. Every machine will have some amount of lag between the time the heavy spot bumps the sensor and the time the sensor measures this vibration. The heavy spot on the rotor passes the sensor before the sensor feels the bump. The angle between the actual heavy spot and when the sensor feels the bump is the system lag. The point at which the sensor measures the peak of vibration is called the high spot. The analyzer compensates for the system lag and in this case calls for a correction weight to be placed at an angle where we cannot attach weights. Our bolt holes are 15 degrees apart and the correction location lies between them. However, most balanced programs have the ability to adjust the weight into two angles in a calculation called split angle. Define the available angles and the specified correction weight and location and new weights will be calculated for each angle. Select these new weights for each angle and weigh them accurately. Record these new weights in the analyzer. For the best results, these must be entered in the analyzer as their precise weights, even if they don't match the specified weights. All future calculations and adjustments are based on this. Attach these correction weights and start the machine to check the results. Make the measurements for both measurement points, accepting them only after they have stabilized. Compare the results to the tolerances required for each measurement point. To reduce the vibration further, perform a trim balance. Select Trim Balance and the required weights to trim it in a little closer will be displayed. Remember, they are based on leaving the previous correction weight on. Weigh the trim weights accurately 
and if necessary, adjust the angle again. Enter the exact weight amount and location in the analyzer and place them on the rotor. Start the machine and make the measurements. Check the results against the tolerances and perform another trim if necessary. When the job is complete, store it and begin another one. Multiple balance jobs can be stored in the analyzer. Your balancing program may differ from this one, but the steps are the same. Remember that the more precise your angle and weight measurements are, the better your results will be. This is not a hit or miss procedure. If you put garbage in, you will get garbage out as a result. Perform the seven pre-balancing checks and develop a repeatable method to achieve the best results. Two-plane balancing is very similar to single-plane balancing and the steps are not complicated. Some personnel look at a two-plane system as two single-plane systems balancing each plane separately. The problem with that method is it ignores the effect it has on the opposite end of the rotor. With the balancing programs available today, the results can be calculated for both planes as easily as one. Let's look at the steps involved in two-plane balancing. First, collect reference run data for all measurement points. Next, place a trial weight on one plane and collect data for all measurement points. The effect this trial weight has on this end of the rotor is called the primary effect, and the effect it has on the opposite end of the rotor is called the cross effect. This next step is where two-plane balancing differs from single-plane balancing. Place a trial weight on the second plane and make measurements at all measurement points. The first trial weight can be left on if it decreased the vibration substantially or it can be removed. Just be sure to record the total weights added for the second trial run measurements. Let the analyzer perform the calculations, then place the weights and check the results. Trim balance until you are within tolerance. Let's walk through this two-plane balance together. Define the balance job, recording the job number, the machine name and ID, and the area of the plant it is in. Define the weight planes as two and two measurement planes. We'll use two measurement points. The photo tack must be mounted in one position for the entire balance job. Do not move it for any reason. Record the location where the tack sees zero degrees and define the sensor type and the display units. Here we will use displacement in mills. Define the location of the sensor for each plane. Again, this is for repeatability and if your program has a graphical capability, it helps assure the correct angle definition. Now we are ready to make measurements. Notice the screen has a listing for two trial runs. This is because we defined the job as two plane. We will make the reference run first. Start the machine and make the reference measurement for each measurement point. Let the averager average the data until it becomes steady, then accept the data. The next step is to make a trial run measurement. Notice that weights can be defined for either plane. We will add a weight to plane one and check the effect. Be sure to get the weight accurate and define it in the analyzer. Attach it to the rotor at the defined angle and then we are ready to check its effect on this end or the primary effect and the opposite end or the cross effect. Again, be sure to let the readings average until they are steady before accepting them. Review the data to see if the first trial weight should be removed or if it can be left on. In this case, we will remove it and place it on plane two at this location. Again, define the weight and location of this trial weight and make the measurements for trial run two. Ensure that the data for each measurement point is consistent run to run. For each run, be sure to follow all safety guidelines, making certain the trial weights are firmly attached and that the balancing compass is removed from the rotor. Now the correction weights can be calculated and will be shown for each of the two measurement planes. The correction is shown for taking the last trial weight off or leaving it on. If the correction weight calls for a weight between two fixed locations, then use the calculator function called split angle. If it calls for a weight that you don't have available, then use the adjust fixed weights option to know where to place them to equal the calculated correction weight. 
attach the correction weights and record in the analyzer the exact amount and exact location they are placed. Start the machine and collect new measurements that are a result of the correction weights applied to both planes. Check the results against the tolerances to see if they meet specs. Then select the trim balance function for the calculated corrections based on leaving all existing weights on. Continue trim balancing until the vibration is within tolerances. Store the balance job so it can be uploaded into the computer. The balance job can be reloaded into the analyzer later and the trial runs can be skipped. Then simply take the reference run and perform the calculations for correction weights. We've only used the basic functions of the balancing programs to perform single and two-plane balancing. They can perform up to four-plane balancing with up to six speeds. For most applications, the basic steps that have been presented here will be successful. To become confident that you can apply these techniques in a real plant situation, you should practice using a small rotor kit that can be balanced with clay or other small weights. Experiment with different trial weights and try adding some different initial unbalance amounts. Although many areas have been covered that will provide a solid foundation for all your future balancing, other areas have been left untouched. Some of these are how resonance affects the balancing process and how to allow for it. How to estimate a trial weight location that will not drive the vibration up but will reduce it. How to determine a system lag and use it to your advantage. How to balance overhung rotors. How to balance belt driven equipment. And how to perform a couple balance. All of these and more are answered in the next video program on balancing, Industrial Application of Balancing. Thank you for joining the thousands who will recognize CSI as leading industry with quality information, instruction and application of PDM and RBM techniques. Whether you use sophisticated equipment and techniques or simple methods and equipment for your balancing, we are confident that the application of the tips and techniques presented here will provide a foundation for all your future balancing. We look forward to assisting you achieve success in your future endeavors.